please give me your name and, and where you live. Okay, my name is Rose Cunningham. And how long have you lived in Atlanta? <laughs> oh, I've lived here like 50 years. <laughs> um, where were you born? I was born in Bucharest, Romania. Um, when were you born there? You won, you won my birth date? Yes. All right, that's fine. Oh, this the year. I don't care. December 12, 1927. Um, how long did you live there? I lived there until the age of um, 10. And then, then where did your family go? And then we went to France. My father was French, and my mother was Romanian. And it was right before World War II. And tell me about why your family went to France. Well, uh, because uh, we found out that uh, we discovered that <laughs> my father was Jewish. Yeah although we celebrated Christmas and, uh, and uh, Easter, and I went to a Catholic school. And one day my father said, well, we're Jewish. We've got to get out of Europe. And that's the reason we went to France, to be able to get the necessary papers to get out of Europe because of uh, the threat of the Nazis. Um, was it very difficult to get to France? No, to France it was not difficult. It was difficult to get to Cuba. That's one of the countries that my father tried to uh, immigrate. He, uh, in those days you could buy visas. In the United States, you cannot buy a visa, even then. But he tried. We were, he w was willing to go anywhere, anywhere in Latin America or in Hong Kong or, or in Australia. And he applied for these visas. And the first one that came through was uh, Cuba. Uh, during that time, Batista was the dictator there. And he was making lots of money with those visas for the Jewish people. Um, being that young at the time, did you really understand uh, why you had to leave because you were Jewish? No, I was absolutely frustrated. I thought I was Catholic. You know, I went to a Catholic school. All my friends were Catholic. What was this about being Jewish? The word Jewish never was, was in my family, not even my grandmother, who was also Jewish. Uh, the anti-Semitic feeling in Romania, uh, the, the movement was extremely active and very dangerous. Um. And, wh and when did your family finally make it into France? It was right before World War II. It was at the beginning of 1939. Do you remember uh, hearing about uh, Germ the German invasion of Poland and how you felt? Oh, yeah. Tell Absolutely. Yeah, it's in my book. <laughs> 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 well, as a matter of fact, I was at the summer camp in Brittany when World War II was uh, declared by France and England. They declared the war on the Germans, and I was having a picnic with my um, friends. We were at a summer camp. It was September 3rd, 1939. I remember clearly. Um, so you were in France when the Germans invaded? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, tell me, I'm reading your, your previous transcripts, very interesting story. Could you tell, tell that to me again? Well, we were, uh, my brother and I were at a summer camp. My, par my parents were in Paris. My father was again, trying to get the visas. And he was working very diligently trying to get these papers, which was very difficult. And also, you had to have a lot of money for that. Well, my father was very smart. He sent money to the United States. So he had the money. But it was a very difficult process. So he sent us, the children, to the summer camp to get us out of his way. And also because, uh, well, war wasn't declared yet. Remember, September 3rd, 1939. So when war was declared, the summer camp uh, dissolved. And my parents joined us, and we stayed in Portmanek, which is in Brittany, a lovely little fishing village that I will never forget. Uh, and they came over there, and we lived there for six months. The war was already on. But the first six months of the war, nothing happened. Uh, if you read the history, you'll see that it was a funny war. Then the Germans, of course, invaded France. And they went through Belgium. They didn't even touch the Maginot Line, which was supposed to keep them away. <laughs> And um, uh, we went back to Paris. And one day before the Germans occupied Paris, we fled. We were on a train. We were going to Marseille, trying to get out. And it, that's when I really got scared, because I realized it was really dangerous. So. Um, <clears throat> do you remember, um, I'm, uh, tell me about the emotions um, in your head and what you saw your parents feeling at the time? Well, I think the most uh, dangerous part of the time of my life was when the train stopped in Bordeaux and they were bombed. Bordeaux was under heavy bombardment <coughs> and it was the British bombing the station. And that is when I really thought we were all going to die. 
because the station was uh, a flame. A lot there were a lot of dead people. Uh, we escaped. We were were saved. Uh, and uh, once once the bombardment stopped, we walked away from the station with the little suitcase we had to a farm, and we asked the farmers to to uh, give us shelter. Uh, my father's plan was to go to Marseille again to get that coveted visa and to get on a ship and get out. And eventually, that's what we did. But uh, uh, we, of course, from that point on, it was very dangerous because we had no transportation. Um, we were scared. <laughs> we were scared. And I was, as a little girl, believe me, I was extremely, I was frightened. But the farmer was very nice. They, they uh, gave us shelter. And then one day they came, listen, I can, we cannot keep you anymore. The Germans are in the village. And uh, we can be sent to jail if we help Jew Jews. And my father was willing to help, uh, pay him. Of course, he paid him to begin with. So anyway, the farmer found a beaten a car that was completely uh, terrible. <laughs> my father was a terrible driver. <laughs> we always had a chauffeur. Anyway, so we made it to Marseille, and the car broke down, and we had to walk. And Marseille was a whole um, organized, the Jewish people were organized how they got, would get the Jews out. Um, it was an organization that was streamlined, and it's incredible how well organized they are, but you still had to have money to pay for all these uh, um, services. You know. And um, uh, my father paid. And he did get the visa, finally. And Cuba was the first country that came through, although he applied to all the other countries. But he did get the visa to, to Cuba. And uh, tell, tell me about uh, about the trip to Cuba and uh, and your arrival. If I may say something before that, because we were in Marseille when Pearl Harbor occurred, and I remember it very well because it was my mother's birthday, and it couldn't have been a better present than to have the Americans go into war and declare war on Germany. So Pearl Harbor to us was uh, a bonanza, and of course uh, because we see we left. Uh, Marseille, 1942, in February of 1942. The Germans had already occupied the second part of France. Once the Americans declared war, it wasn't this of, uh, that they were only in half of France. If you read the history, you'll see how the Germans proceeded. So we left on a ship. What was that question you asked me before, though? Oh, well, actually, uh, I, I have another question. What was the public, re public reaction uh, in Marseille? Marseille? Marseille. About, uh, the, uh, about, about the Americans? Oh. Everybody was jubilant, but you had to be very careful. You couldn't show your emotions. You get to j you go to jail. We were not allowed to listen to BBC. That was under strict. Um, um, that was strictly illegal. And my father had a little radio, and he put it under the bed, and he would listen to it. My brother would go downstairs and make sure that there was no police in the street. Uh, we were s terrified. We were not free. We didn't have freedom, and that could have cost our lives. And that's when he, of course, heard the news and. Everybody in Marseille, the people that heard it, and of course they didn't hear it unless they listened to BBC. That was not uh, on the French broadcast, not until later. Uh, my question was uh, about <laughs> the trip to Cuba and the arrival. Okay. Well, the trip to Cuba was uh, terrible. It was six weeks long. I was very sick. I had a beginning of TB. I was underfed, and I got terribly sick. And we changed ships. We had to go to... Casablanca first, and there we, uh, we got on a uh, Spanish freighter, and from there to Cuba, through Jamaica, and the, Jews re uh, the Jewish refugees, of course, there were 500 of us. That was, by the way, the last ship out of Marseille. And the refugees that were on board, you must remember that these people had money. You couldn't get out otherwise. Some of the ones that were killed in concentration camp. They just, some of them may have had money, but they weren't smart enough to get out. So the trip was a very long. Uh, men were on one side, women on the other of the ship. They had to sleep on the floor. It was not a pleasant trip. Since I was sick, they put me in the infirmary, and that was a blessing in disguise. <laughs> and my mother was there with me. And we arrived in Cuba. And when we arrived in Cuba, the officials came on board, and they said, well, I'm sorry, but this visa is no good anymore. And my father paid $1,000 per person, which $1,000 per person in those days was like, over $100,000 today. It was a lot of money. Say, so, oh, that's not good anymore. The law has changed. If you want to stay in Cuba, you have to raise some more money. So they put us in a camp that they had 
organized for to raise more money. And again, because of my father's contacts in the United States, we were amongst those that were able to stay in that camp. And the camp was okay. It was not it was, women and men were again separated because they did not have the facilities. It was like dormitory. So we were there for six months until the money came through, and, and then we were let out into Havana. And that is when our new life started. Um, tell me, just briefly, tell me about, about what that new life entailed for your family. Well, of course, we had to learn Spanish, and uh, that was not difficult. We learned Spanish in four months. We were fluent, because you must remember that we spoke many languages already, Romanian and French. My father also spoke German. Um, we spoke some Italian. So that those were the Romance language. So one more Romance language is not that difficult to learn. We learned very fast. I had to go to school, of course, and uh, my brother also. And we, start, we settled down and started a new life. And at the beginning, it was very difficult. But we got used to it. We loved Cuba. Cuban people are wonderful. And uh, little by little, my father got a job, and he start, started selling ca national cash registers. He worked for National Cash Register Company. He was a good salesman. <laughs> So he made good money, and soon we were able to move in a nicer home. And I was going to high school by then. Um, so l life um, resumed uh, in a normal pace for us. Um, what, sort of, what sort of things do you remember about the war in Europe, uh, specifically while you were there in Cuba, the news you heard, bits and pieces? Okay, very good. I like this question. My father had a map which, by the way, I still have, a map of Europe. And he would listen to the news, and he would mark down every town that was occupied, either by the Russians or by the Allied forces, you know, England and France. Well, it was the, like today you call it the, um, uh, the coalition. Then they also had sort of a coalition. It was called something different. So he would mark on this map, and we knew exactly when the Germans and the Russians were coming closer and the combat zones. We had that map. <laughs> Uh, so if every time the, uh, the Americans or the English or the British would uh, win, of course, we would have big celebrations. We'd drink lots of wine and toast the event. So we, we, uh, we followed very closely. We also learned later on, of course, my father had some cousins, and they, were, they died in the concentration camp. We knew, had we not left, that we, that would have been our fate. There's no doubt about it. In my mind, we would have perished in Auschwitz or one of the, the camps had we not left. Um, what about, does D-Day stand out more than, more than the other Allied victories in your mind? The invasion of Normandy, yes, D-Day. Yes, of course, again, you know, my father marked on <laughs> there, and it was great jubilation. Uh, but of course, the day the war was over, there was dancing in the streets of Havana. I remember that also. And we'd go to the French embassy and have champagne. Because my father was, of course, French, and we, we really had French culture in our home. Um, what, what went through your mind on VE Day? On Victory Day? Yes. Well, uh, I was very young, you know, but um, I was dancing in the street, and I was a teenager. So I got uh, very involved with all the other teenagers. And strangely enough, you know, the Cuban uh, youth, they were very well informed. They knew about World War II. They knew about history. And they were on the street, too. Everybody was dancing and kissing. and Just what happened here, I'm sure. <laughs> you must have pictures of that day. What, a, what kind of effect did, did World War II have on Cuba at that time? Was there rationing like there were in other countries or anything no. like that? No, not really. But, of course, you know that the Americans had a base over there. Not only Guantanamo, but there was a base in Havana. And of course, that's where my husband was stationed, the Air Force. Uh, tell me a little bit about your husband. Okay, we, uh, we met at a dance. I was 18, I didn't speak English, and he didn't speak a word of any of the other languages. But we learned that we don't need the language when you love. <laughs> it's the own language. It's called amor. <laughs> and my parents were absolutely, they were, they were not happy. They did not want me to get married that young. I was too young for them. But I fell in love with uh, this very handsome uh, captain, you know, in his Air Force uniform. And um, we got married in Cuba. 
and then um, then how long before you actually came over to the States? Oh, well, we came together. We got married, and I was uh, considered a war bride. You see, I had a French passport. Uh, this you didn't ask me. I, I was born in Romania, but I was actually French because my father was with the French government. He was a French diplomatic corps in Europe before the war. So I had a French passport. And I came into Miami as a war bride. I didn't have any, any problems. And uh, it was my, my husband, but uh, I, my English was very limited. Uh, when did you actually, when did you make it into Miami? What year was that? That was in 1946, December 23rd, 24. The reason I remember that is because we got married on the 23rd. I said to my husband, I'll never get married again the day, two days before Christmas. My birthday is in December, my anniversary is in December, Christmas is in December. You know, you get one present. So we got married on December 23rd, and then on 46, the 24th, we were in Miami coming over uh, to Atlanta. My husband was studying at Georgia Tech, by the way. He had already, he was already out of the Air Force and uh, under the GI Bill, I believe, he applied, he wanted to be an architect. And then my new life started. Was he a Georgia native? Yes. He was born in Alabama, and I have always kidded him about that. So uh, it was very uh, difficult for me. Uh, I must tell you that the culture shock was much greater than Cuba. The culture shock was the United States. And because, uh, maybe because um, the language was different, it was not uh, a, uh, a Latin language, probably because of that. Ask me what my first culture shock was. What's that? <laughs> well, my, my husband took me to, my, to his grandparents' uh, home in uh, North Alabama, and it was Christmas Day. It was very cold. And here I came from a very warm climate, and I asked my husband where, where, was, the where was the facility or the bathroom. He said, oh, come on, I'm show you. He took me outside, and that was called the outhouse. <laughs> well, let me tell you, that was a terrible culture shock. <laughs> I cried. I said, what have I done? God, take me back to Cuba. <laughs> so it was, uh, that was one of the first culture shocks I had, and I had others also. Um, obviously, you, you, had, you have great ties uh, with Europe and the travails mm -hmm. it went through during the war. Um, did the war in the Pacific Theater ever really play into your, your thoughts or your life that much? Not really, except Pearl Harbor. You know that, but not the rest of it didn't. Um, what about um, the dropping of the atomic bomb? Do you remember hearing about that? Of course. T tell me a little bit about that. Of course, we were in school when that happened, and it was a matter of great discussion. And the children, of course, you know, I was in high school, discussed that. And uh, but I tell you, everybody was very happy that it uh, was done in order to to get uh, in order for the war to end. And uh, wasn't that it was uh, there was no anti-American feeling at all. Uh, I never found any anti-American feeling. As a matter of fact, everybody loved the United States in those days. But you feel that's changed now. Oh yes, now it has changed a lot. Yes. Absolutely. And, you know, we didn't have that kind of press then. We didn't have the media like you do now and many other reasons, but let's not go into that. <laughs> um, what, and this question is going to apply much more to you than it has some other veterans, um, but could you tell me what larger effects World War II has had on your life? Oh, I would say that World War II had a tremendous effect in my life because I'm a survivor. And I was very much aware what would have happened had we stayed in, in, uh, in France. Uh, with Annie Frank, you know, our, our stories were very, uh, very parallel because when we were in Marseille, uh, we lived in a little attic apartment that was hidden also. And there we were scared that we might get caught. It's a horrible feeling when you're that young and to be scared when you leave your apartment or you're, you're scared of everything and everybody. It is horrible. And it's, uh, it makes a, uh, a mark on you, believe me. <laughs> what, uh, tell, me your, tell me what you think about the Germans, then and now. 
Well, now I don't, I don't like German language as much because it brings back memories. I hated them then. <laughs> We'd call them Le Bosch. You know, that was a French name for the Germans. Of course, you know, the French had their resistance, remember? So we learned a lot about that. And, uh, my brother, who was two years older, wanted to join the resistance. And my father said, no, no way, you're not joining anything. But uh, it was a great uh, French feeling. For, for f there was a tremendous patriotism in France at that time. Uh, it's not today, but it was then. And uh, uh, we were very much aware of, of the danger of World War II. So the word, what I can only say to you is that I'm a survivor. Um, obviously, World War II had uh, far-reaching and almost infinite effects on every part of the globe. Um, Tell me a little bit, um, t tell me your opinion of how the U.S. has changed since the end of the war until now. Um, just, uh, again, it's, it's a huge topic, but just it is. Some <laughs> of the one or two large issues that you see with the United States becoming the superpower it did after the war. Well, let me tell you first that I think this is the most wonderful country in the world. And the fact that young people are dying so that we can enjoy our freedoms means a lot to me. I'm extremely patriotic. I have my flag out, and I'm so American at heart that you wouldn't believe, because I feel uh, what this country has done for me. This country has done for me so many things, and this country has done so much for other people. Uh, that's the reason I love this country, and uh, uh, I believe in its democratic principles. And um, what can I tell you? I'm a, I'm a real American uh, patriot. <laughs> Of course, and I'm an, I'm, an, I'm an American citizen now, you realize that. Yes. I've been for many years. Um, the videos that will be in the exhibit, literally thousands and thousands of school children will, uh, will come through there. What do you want to tell them and future generations um, about the experiences and the sacrifices that were made during the war? Well, I, I want to tell them that not to take anything for granted, that what they have, the freedoms that they enjoy in this country, that people have fought for that and died for it. I think this is extremely important. And I don't think that message is getting through as much as it should. It's so important, your, your freedom. You can, you know, this is the most democratic country in the world. It really is. Here you can make a success of yourself if you work hard, or you can make a failure of yourself. But you're in charge. And there's no police state. You don't have to worry about uh, the police being right there to arrest you or, or you have to hide from, from, from something uh, f from your daily activity. I think having freedom is the most precious season, uh, next to your life, of course, your health. It's the most precious thing you can have. And I want the children to get this message, not to forget every day of their lives they are free. They live in a free country where the opportunities are so numerous. Tell, tell me just a little bit about uh, your impressions of Atlanta when you first arrived here. <laughs> well, when I first arrived here, I thought this was the end of the world. <laughs> it was extremely, um, how should we say, um, provincial. Of course, it's changed. But uh, I was uh, very frustrated at the beginning. And when I started learning English, of course, I... Um, I realized that things weren't as bad as I thought, <laughs> but I was frustrated because I've always lived in the big city. I lived in Bucharest and I lived in Paris and in Havana. And so it was frustrating to, to um, the provincial aspect of it. But uh, this changed, you know, and I made a contribution to its change. I made a contribution to the city of Atlanta in many ways with my, some of my work. Um. Modern Atlanta likes to think of itself as an international city. Do you think it's made it there? <laughs> well, let me tell you that an international city, uh, it depends uh, who, uh, who describes what is an international city. Atlanta has an international airport, yes. Atlanta has a, lot, uh, a great Hispanic uh, population now and some other foreign elements, which is very good. But in my 
opinion. Atlanta is not an international city as yet because Atlanta's international, um, pers uh, the, the, uh, how would you say, the, um, um, the way people think over here, I'm talking about you know, the Americans, of course, what is an international city? It's not the same as what people think in Paris or in London or in Brussels. It's not the same perception, no. But I love Atlanta, don't get me wrong. But it's, since you've asked me that directly, and I don't want to be insulting at all, I think uh, Atlanta does uh, not have yet an international, um, how would you say it, psychology? I don't know the word that I would use. I can think of the right word right now because you surprised me with this question. Would you say that that um, is endemic throughout the nation or that there are some places where oh, no. things are a little less provincial than others? Oh, yes, there's a lot less provincial. You know, you take Chicago, New Orleans, uh, San Diego, and, you know, not New York because New York, of course, is normal, or Washington would be an international city. Other, uh, but, uh, you know, this, um, especially in this house, I think that... Um, it has, uh, it's done a lot, but it's still got a, some way to go. The attitude, that's a word I wanted, I couldn't think of it. I think the attitude uh, of, uh, of the local, the southerners, it's not exactly international. <laughs> you know, when you think about an international city, or you say you land in Nice, I'll give you this as an example, or. Well, not only you hear the languages, and you do begin to hear languages here, but you have all the facilities too. You have, you can exchange your money. Of course, that we're not going to have a problem with that anymore in Europe because of the euro. But you can exchange your money at the airport, and you can go into a department store and change money if you have to. And you have multilingual signs, and we don't have that so not as much as we should. We like a lot, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, they're trying to to remedy that, and I'm sure they will eventually. But the fact that we are having a bigger Hispanic population, it's a great help, I can tell you. Um, switching tracks for a moment, how, having come so close uh, to being in a, in a concentration camp, um, what are your thoughts um, of course, again, a huge topic that you've got to sum up uh, in an unfair way at short notice. But what are your thoughts on the Holocaust that you want to impress on future generations? Well, I sure hope it never happens again. I think it was the most horrible, despicable um, experience uh, of, a, of, uh, of our society. The one that I knew, of course. You know, I'm sure maybe during the Inquisition it was bad too, but I don't know that much about the Inquisition well, uh, since I'm a product of World War II. And I think that it was horrible. And I'm sure that uh, uh, if you saw um, Schindler's List, which was ex very, uh, it was uh, very um, explicit to see those little children the way they were killed only because they were Jewish. Well, anyway, it's a very... It's a horrible thing that happened, and uh, it, have, it definitely, when I think about it, I cry because I, I cannot help but remember that I could have been one of the victims easily, only because my antecedents, my, my family's roots were, were Jewish, which, of course, I had no idea. <laughs> um, is there anything that we haven't covered here that, that you would like to address? Uh, yes, if you don't mind, I'd like to say one thing that, first that I'm writing my memoirs, <laughs> and everything I said, it's in my book, but uh, when I came, first came to Atlanta and I saw that how provincial Atlanta was, I decided to do something about it. So I'm the one that started the uh, French and Spanish conversation classes at the YMCA for adults, and we're continuing that at Emory. I want to say that, and also that uh, I was a director of the international department at the Atlanta Chamber of Commerce for 10 years. And that is when I tried to make a contribution to make the city more international. And I think we did, we reached that when we had the Olympics over here. I mean, it didn't last. <laughs> um, of course, you're, you're working on your memoirs now. Mm -hmm. uh, how often 
recently and in in years past did you think about your time in Europe just one step ahead of the storm? How, how often did you think about that? Well, of course, when I was talking to my children, my grandchildren, I thought about it, and I would tell them the stories that I'm telling you. So you think about these, these things you don't forget. They make an indelible impression in your life, especially because they happen at that time when you're um, between 10 and 12. You know, that is a very formative year in a child's life. And you remember, believe me. All right, I think that's, uh, that's about all we need for from uh, Mrs. Cunningham. You're going to okay. Thank you very much. I didn't smile too much, did I? <laughs> you were perfect. Yeah. You were absolutely glorious. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much.